Everyone in the YouTube audience, welcome. We're just going to get started in a moment. Let our live audience in here. Okay, welcome everyone. We're just going to be a moment here to let everybody in. Welcome to those of you who are watching live on YouTube on CCTV. And welcome to those of you who are joining us live here in the Zoom room for the Friday webinar today. I'm Executive Director of Conservatory Canada, Derek Auger. Welcome to the Friday webinar. And today we have sort of the next in our installment on looking at teaching beginning piano. And we have Marjorie Purdy back. Some of you may have seen our introduction we did to this series about three weeks ago, where we had a long hour long discussion about many topics that we could possibly cover through a series about teaching beginning piano. And so we have Marjorie who's come back to talk to us about keyboard connection for kids, how to work with youngsters and teaching them how to interface and, and, and lock into the piano right from the very first few lessons. She has all sorts of really great ideas that she's going to share with us over the next hour. And we just have a little preliminary question for you. Those of you that are here in the Zoom room live, if you can type into the chat box, just quickly in a few words or a sentence, what do you think technique is? What is technique to you? If you could give us some feedback, that would be really good. And that's what we're basically going to cover today, or Marjorie's going to cover today. I'm going to be in the background. Um, and then as we wait for a couple of stragglers to join here, uh, just by way of looking at the future here into the Friday webinars coming up, our, our Friday webinars are going to take a bit of a spring break over the next two weeks. I'm going to be away the next two Fridays and so unable to host a webinar, but we're going to come back on Friday, March 10th. Eleanor and Cecile are going to join us again for their next installment of looking at women composers and music by women composers, finishing off their series on British composers that they started last week. I would encourage you to check that out. A really great pedagogical information in it all sorts of performance practice ideas. And they're gonna look at those same composers with music for later grades on March 10th. That'll be the next Friday webinar. I'll give you an email in a couple of weeks about that. And then nothing planned yet for March 17th, but on March 24th, we're gonna have Alessandra DiCenzo come in, who's gonna to talk to us further about beginning piano and her research that she conducted at the Piano Lab at University of Ottawa with Dr. Gilles Como about what methods and what ways of teaching students to read staff notation work the best? And I think you're going to find that really enlightening and interesting, and it's going to spawn a couple of other talks as well later in the spring on the same topic. So we've got a couple of people here giving us ideas about technique, technical skills to be able to play artistically, someone else just simply a tool for expression. These are great ideas. If anyone else has any thoughts on that, feel free to throw them into the webinar chat box. If anyone has any questions along the way today during Marjorie's presentation, throw them in the chat box, throw them in the Q&A, and we'll stop at the end and have a big Q&A. And if anyone wants at the end, you can also raise your hand and we can bring you on live. So thanks for joining us today. I'm going to turn this over to Marjorie Purdy. Marjorie is a, a CC examiner, has been for a very long time, even examined with the Western Board before CC existed. She's out in Coquitlam, B.C., and uh, I've known her for a long time. We've both been examiners with CC for quite a while now, uh, almost 20 years, really. And uh, I'm just turning it over to her. She's a seasoned teacher, um, and you're going to get all sorts of great ideas from her. And I'm looking forward to the presentation myself. So Marjorie, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for putting time into this presentation today. And we look forward to your thoughts. Thank you very much, Derek. Uh, welcome to everybody. And uh, I just want to explain a little bit where uh, the background for this presentation came from. My mother was a wonderful teacher uh, and she was a really masterful teacher of young children uh, and so I used a lot of her ideas and I also took pedagogy from a wonderful teacher named Winifred Scottwood and she also really informed how I did things. Now she didn't necessarily teach us how to teach beginners so I took what I learned from her on how to teach technique and what I learned from my mom. And I put the two of them together and came up with this way to try to help students right from the, right from the very beginning. 
And I really enjoyed the uh, answers to what is technique. Over the years I've given this uh, workshop, it was at that time rather than a webinar, and I've had a lot of different answers. Scales, chords, arpeggios, um, <clears throat> the other ability to play fast. And I enjoyed the answers that people gave here because they're actually really online with what I think. Uh, one person said a tool for expression, another person said, uh, I believe it was uh, to play expressively. Mm -hmm. Both of those things, are, I believe, are absolutely bang on. Uh, to me, technique is the ability to play the sound one imagines in one's head. We've all had the uh, experience of we imagine a sound and we can't make it. We don't have the mechanics sorted out to be able to make the sound we imagine. So we want to be free enough and we want to have a pathway between our brain and our arm and our hand and our fingers that is clear and immediate. Okay, so if you hear an unwanted sound, you make the change and it's almost unconscious. You don't even realize you're doing it. And of course that takes years of training and listening, but we want to begin that training and listening right away, right at the beginning. So good technique really equals a good connection to the keyboard. So if we have a good connection, basically the idea is that this part of our hand is very firm, okay, and our wrist is very, very soft, very flexible. Our arms are soft and flexible, and these knuckles down here are also firm. So students tend to have what I call mushy fingers, okay, or very collapsed fingers, and that creates a tight wrist. And, or if you ask them to round their fingers and to get their arch up, they also tend to do that with a tight wrist too. So this concept of having firmness here and flexibility here, this is what we're trying to teach. And it's a challenge, okay? Uh, not an easy thing to get across. It's a feeling, once you've got it, it's fantastic. But it can be a little bit hard to find. And the other aspect that falls into technique is also really around muscle timing. It's not just about muscle strength, but about timing. And it's, it's having a pulse of energy for as long as required. So if we work all the time, we don't ever get any chance to have what's recovery, basically. So if I play a scale and I work all the time, I push on every note, I get something that sounds like that. Not the most musical scale you've ever heard. And uh, it's tiring. You know, my, my speed is pretty maxed. Now, if I relax and I don't work all the time, I'm doing it very, very quickly in there, play release, play release, play release, play release, then I've timed it. I'm only using each finger for the exact amount of time I need it, and then I relax. Okay? So, for efficient muscle timing, we have to have relaxation. You're only using that muscle as long as needed and only when you need it. The other fingers and the other muscles aren't working. Okay, so common signs of tension in your students and yourself too, right? We all do this at different times. Stiff wrists, uh, high shoulders, and sometimes they only need to be this high. You know, it doesn't have to be a lot. It can even just be this. That makes a difference. And I call the crooked fingers syndrome, right? Where things are, you know, they're playing with one finger and everything else is sticking up. So what's your role as a teacher? I believe it's to help the student find the easiest way to play, to work with the piano and not fight it, okay? The way of least resistance. When you play the piano technically well, it feels physically easy. Now sometimes that takes more mental effort. It takes more mental effort to do that, but it should feel physically easy. So why is that important? Well, a lot of freedom. Right? When we're talking back to our definition of technique, the ability to play the sound you hear in your head, that's hugely rewarding and encouraging for the students because they can play well and they experience less difficulties. Now, technical exercises are one way of achieving this. There's, it's not the only way, but thoughtful and consistent practice of this is a way to get it. And they're basically like the drills in sports. They just provide tools. They provide tools for things we're going to use to play pieces or to improvise or to compose, whatever it may be that the students want to do. And this kind of study can begin in the first weeks of lessons and they set up habits for a lifetime. And this is a wonderful time to have students to do this with. It is much, much easier to do this with beginners. Young children learn to play with ease. 
They learn very intuitively. Their brains are not hardwired yet. They're very open. And they pick up an awful lot just by watching you do. Um, that's why they learn languages so quickly or they can pick up a sport much quicker than an adult can. And of course, good habits are much easier to learn correctly from the start rather than trying to change them later. So the first aspect is to get your students sitting well. And I know that that can be hard with some of the little ones. So we're going to just talk about what's the optimal place to be. Realizing that this is a journey and a lot of young children are not going to be there on the first lesson or perhaps even sometimes that first year. Or you might get them there for five minutes of their lesson. You know, you're working at it over time. You want to have their feet flat on the floor. A lot of them are little, so you might need a stool. And then it's important that they're in the right place at home. So, you know, you don't have to buy something expensive. I have a IKEA stool here that cost, I think, five or six dollars 20, no, maybe not 20 years, 18 years ago when my kids were little. Uh, a lot of people have it in their house if they have young children because their children stood on stools to wash their hands. So I usually said, do you have a do you have a stool? Just put it there and, and you can use that. I like this one because if they stand up on it, it won't tip. I have another one that's a bit higher, but it tips and that worries me. Uh, you want to be careful they don't have one foot forward or one foot back because that puts the hips out of alignment. The back, you want the back to be straight, okay? I'm in my office chair here, but you want the back to be straight. And I use the idea of a marionette puppet. Uh, that there's a string that goes from here up to the ceiling, okay, and that keeps your spine nice and straight. And the shoulders are down and relaxed, and if kids have high shoulders, I get them to lift them up, and then <sighs> let them down with a nice big sigh. The sound effects are very important, because then we have a giggle. Uh, now, freedom of arms. This is very important as well. We want to have loose elbows that are floating, not glued to the side. We don't want to play the piano like this. As one of my students called it, that's the T-Rex piano, the T-Rex dinosaur playing. So we want to have some, some, uh, some space in here. And I use the idea of elbows, uh, sorry, balloons under the elbows, okay? If our elbows are glued to our sides, this really wrecks the hat position of the hand because it tilts your hand sideways and then you would be playing an instrument like this well the piano is like this so if you let your elbow come out slightly like not not crazy but just let it come out slightly then your hand is at a level in this case at the same angle the same level as the piano now, from a teacher perspective the support to do that comes from the muscles between the shoulder blades the ones that if you row if you're rowing like this, you can feel them moving. If kids' elbows start to go down, I just gently remind them with my hand. Or if, say, they've got, I talked about balloons or bubbles, I'll say, oh no, the bubbles are going to pop. And we do things like that just to make it a little bit more interesting. The wrists, you want them about level with the hands. Not too low, not too high, because you're going to use energy. Think of the energy like water that's flowing down here and it's flowing into the keys. If the wrist is too high, the water shoots off this way. If you're down here, the water pools. So we want that energy to go in here. I am a little bit high. Uh, mostly that has to do with my glasses, so, uh, I, so I can see what I'm doing. I should, technically, if I'm playing, be a tiny bit lower, but my glasses are trumping so that I can see. And that's also another thing is just having an adjustable chair in terms of getting the arms at the right height. I do have one. It definitely makes things easier. Sometimes students don't have them at home and I'm like, well, experiment with something to sit on, see if you can find something in the house. Uh, it really makes a difference. And in terms of finding the right height, you want the arms just about level with the piano, maybe just slightly higher and don't want them way down here and we don't want them way up here and in terms of how far i know some teachers use this to me if i do that i'm actually a bit too far away so i i prefer about here i feel like i'm ready here i just sort of say to students your elbows are just slightly in front of your body 
uh, if you are like this, you know, you can't move. If you're like this, you don't have control over your arms. So if you're here and you can swing from side to side, you're in a pretty good spot. Now, you're trying to convince students that they need to do this, and it is not always easy. I will sometimes, and everybody can try this, if you hunch your back, lift your shoulders up, tighten all your fingers, and wiggle them. Okay, and then sit up tall, relax your shoulders, and wiggle your fingers. This is significantly easier. And this allows you to move your fingers easily. The reason for that is, we are a connection of joints and bones. And when we hunch over, so say we talk about your shoulder bone, shoulder bone, this is your shoulder socket and your arm bone sticks in here. When you hunch over, this compresses. This bone has less room to move. So when we hunch over and lift our shoulders and make everything tight, we have compressed joints all over and therefore our fingers can't move as well. Now that's the reason for a teacher. The kids are just gonna feel it, okay? now. Hand position. I have to admit, I never use uh, the idea, I never usually say hand position to students. We talk about shape, maybe of hands, and then I use a lot of analogies or metaphors. But what we are looking for is we want to have round fingers, which everybody knows, of course, and these knuckle joints, particularly this first one, very engaged. All right, so I use the idea of igloos pencil tip fingers, spiders, bunny paws, bear paws, teddy bear paws, uh, bridges, some kids are really into bridges or building, arch, I tend to use words like that, know your student, uh, I use Captain America's shield, if they walk in with superhero t-shirt, whatever I see or I know about my student then that's what I will use. Little exercises you can do, and I do this one right at the first lesson, the, I call these circles, and they're going to touch their second finger to their first finger and just press and stop. Press, stop. Press, stop. And they do that three times for each finger. It also has an added bonus I'm finding lately. Some of the kids, their manual dexterity is not where it was maybe 20 years ago. I think maybe people aren't coloring or doing as many things. And some kids putting one and five together is actually really tricky and, and they, they need to go like this to get it. So it also just really helps with uh, just getting that, just beginnings of dexterity. Trouble zones in hand position generally will be the outsides of the hands, whether they are the thumb or the fifth finger. The fifth finger is quite problematic. A lot of times you see kids fall down. Right? You know what I'm adjudicating? I'll see a lot of students playing their fifth finger like this. Or the other one is just turning on its side. So playing like this. And Think of it like the nail is facing this part of the piano. When we do that, we turn our hand at an angle again. But well, the piano is this way. So I try to sort of say to my students, is your nail facing the fall board? Okay, that's where you're looking for. And we want this, this joint out. Now this is tough, it's a little finger. And if you're teaching a small child, it's really tiny. And they don't have much muscle behind it. But we work on it. We could try to get square on the tip of that fifth finger. And we work to build this muscle, and I'll sometimes get them to touch mine, which I think is hysterical because it's so much bigger than theirs. Then we have to talk about the thumb. Thumb's also problematic. A lot of times students play down on the side. Again, this pulls your arch down, pulls a hand position out of where we want it. So we want to be a little bit more perpendicular, and you want to play on the corner, corner of the thumb. Sometimes I draw a dot on there, as long as it's not going to come off on the piano. Check your pen first. And draw a little dot and say, are you on the dot? Okay, just to try to get kids up on it a little bit. So why is it important to have the hand position? You cannot have good technique without it. You can practice and practice and practice and practice and practice and practice. And eventually you're going to run into a wall with your facility, no matter how much you practice. This arch is what catches the weight from the arm. Okay, and if it's smushy, it doesn't harness the weight we're trying to put into the keyboard. You need these firm uh, knuckles. And I use the idea of skating. If you skate, can you skate with wobbly ankles? Can you run with wobbly ankles? So the, this part is our ankles. And if they're doing this, you're never going to be able to go very fast. And I'll also show them, I'll play a scale. 
as best as I can with my fingers falling down. And that's about my max. All right. And then I'll show them one with my fingers up and said, well, I can play fast. I know how to do it. I've learned how to do it, but I can't do it with my fingers falling down. And they're never also going to have a good tone. If they've got collapsed, mushy fingers, never going to have a good tone. And let's talk about arm weight. Again, I don't use the term arm weight with little ones. I don't even use it sometimes with big ones. Um, but the, what we're going to talk about is basically developing legato arm weight transfer in beginners. And I would never use the words legato arm weight transfer with a young child. You just watch their eyes glaze over. Uh, the first thing I do with them is something called wristbands. Okay, and this is really, the youngest child can do this, uh, even the ones with less developed manual dexterity. We're just going to take finger two, we're going to keep it round, and we're just going to go into the note. Up, down, up. Now that looks simple enough if you are a teacher, and all kinds of wonderful things can happen when a young child does it. This finger collapses down like this, they do this. There's a lot of different things that can happen. But we're aiming for down with the wrist, arch and finger staying up. I'll show you with this hand, it's a bit easier to see. Okay. And I get the students to feel my wrist to see how soft it is and then feel theirs. Is it as soft? Uh, I also guide them a lot. I will come along and help their wrist move and help their fingers stay round. You're looking for the two things together and that is quite difficult for some students and this is not something that just happens like that. Some kids can just do it. That's be thankful if you run into that. Most of the time that's not the case and you have to work at this over time. I start with finger two and finger three and finger four. I avoid the outside of the hand to start with. Okay, a lot of beginner methods just start with finger two, three, and four anyway. Uh, I have students say the motion down, up, down, up. Then once they've mastered that, then I want to do the double wrist bend. So basically they're now going to go between two fingers in a row. And they do down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. So they're just going back and forth between two fingers. Start with two, three, and three, four. When those are feeling good, I start adding in 4, 5, and 2, 1. Watch carefully when you do this step. This is a really common thing to see. They go down here and up on here. Okay. And they're not actually getting their arm weight into that second finger. And I'm not saying you never play the piano like that, because you do. It's a great accent touch. But for what we're trying to do here, it's not what we're looking for. So it's down, up. And again, you can guide their wrist. Non-legato is fine. In fact, in a lot of ways, it's easier. Uh, they're more likely to play it properly if to do it that way. Uh, this is the, basically this little exercise. It's the foundation of technique and the foundation of connection because their fingers are going to stay round while the wrist moves. I also really encourage the kids to watch their fingers. And I'll ask them, did your fingers stay round? And I said, well, you better be the parent. You've got to tell your fingers what to do. You've got to boss them around. And they, they tend to watch a little bit more and see if things are round. I'll say, it's your chance. Once they've got that double wrist bend, then we want to do walking. Now, walking's just the kid's name for legato. So they're going to do the exact same thing, but hold their finger down when they lift their wrist. That can be problematic as well. The easiest way to fix it is just to touch your finger on theirs when they lift their wrist. So they get the feeling of that. And you just say down, down, up, down, up, down, up. If they don't get it the first week, it's not too important. I usually say to them, it's okay, just do your best, keep the down, up motion. I'll help you again next week. It's a feel and they're not always going to get it right away. If they've got a really engaged parent, the parent can touch their finger at home, but some kids don't and you, you know, they still need to learn to play legato. So we just work at it over a process of weeks and it, it doesn't always come on the first week. The other thing is to, if they're really having a hard time, is to just play one note and lift their wrist up and down while they hold the note down, okay, keeping their arch up. 
that can help as well. Then they learn the feeling that, oh, I can lift, I can lift my weight out of the key. Like they've lifted their, from a teacher perspective, what's happening is you've lifted your weight out of the key so you can transfer it to the next. Okay. And so students, sometimes when they lift their weight out of the key, they let go. So we're just trying to get that sense of being able to hold it even when you lift. And there's a lot of different things that the kids have learned here and, and just some different teaching concepts when you're doing this because it is different teaching this to young children. Young children, they learn by copying and by feel. They do not learn intellectually. So I'm showing you intellectually because you are adults and you do learn this way. But then I transfer it into how is a young child going to learn this? I use as few words as possible when I'm teaching this. I start with demonstrating and then I add words as necessary. I see what they do and then I add in, okay, that worked. Don't need to talk about that. That didn't. We're going to talk about that. And then I also only try to refine one thing per week. No child is going to sit and do what I just did easily. They all were going to need some tweaking and some, some refining. If you give them too much to fix in one week, they balk. Okay, and then some kids this is hard, depending on their dexterity, and then lots of praise when they're working on it. Not necessarily when they get it, but when they're working on it and working towards understanding it and feeling it. Through all those exercises I just showed you, there's no rush to add new things. There's no rush to move on to the next step. You're better off to wait until you're sure the student gets it, because this is a very cumulative process and you need a strong foundation at each step before you add the next one. If you move too fast, it gets too difficult and then kids are discouraged. You've created an environment of failure, which is you never want. Um, you want an environment of success. That builds confidence and also, frankly, it's really important for the joy of learning and practicing. So now, the rate of progress you make is going to depend on a few things. Uh, age is a big one and also the level of coordination and sometimes their ability to focus too. Now, when we do this, you might think to yourself, how much are we going to do this? I usually do this for maybe two to five minutes at the beginning of the lesson. I think it's really important to start teaching a little bit of technique right from the second lesson. And how much I spend depends on the day, to how much attention I have from them, what kind of day they're having, what else we're doing. Maybe we're preparing for a recital. I don't spend very much time on this. But I do it every lesson for just a short period of time. And I've set up a habit that I want to continue for as long as they study piano. I've said this is important. And, but just by putting it first and by doing it every week. This leads, and I tend to do technique first in lessons all the way through uh, with all my students. So they've learned to walk with all their different fingers, and they're an expert walker now, between one and two, two and three, three and four, and four and five. So they come to their lesson, and I say, oh, you're so good at walking. We're now going to walk with all your fingers in a row, and we're going to play something called the key song. Now, the key song is just a fancy name for a pentachord. So I'll show you, I'll just change my camera so you can see. All we do is C, D, F, G, wait. That's the key of C, wait, chord. Very simple little exercise. We do it hand separate in both hands. And should be fairly easy if they've learned to do their walking well this is an easy easy step to do the new addition is the chord now you may have noticed I just used finger one and five for the chord there's a really good reason for that when you start putting three in kids tend to do this they pull their elbow in they do weird things with their hand position it kind of comes out like this and then five doesn't sound when they use one and five you're developing that arch it's a lot easier to check that they're up on five and also check the angle of their arm that they don't pull in their arm to help their thumb but instead they have their arm over their fifth finger the fingers are little they need lots of help thumbs are big they've got a lot of muscle they don't need the help and after you've played one and five for literally months 
and you think, okay, yeah, they've got that. You can add the third finger in, and it usually goes in within a week or two quite easily. And they don't lose that sense of keeping up on their fifth finger. Now, things to emphasize when you go to the pentachord or the key song, you want to keep the fingers round and still keep that wrist moving down and up on each one. Okay. Check that they're not tilting over on five, but they're up. And check where they're playing on their thumb. Make sure it's still staying and they don't yank in for their thumb. That's a really common thing. Other thing that happens, and I do start to work on this even in walking, uh, it's the crooked finger syndrome. So I'll ask kids to put their hand on their lap and make their fingers really tight. And then try to go one, two, three, four, five. And you can just try it on your lap, see how it feels with your hand tight. And then I'll get them to relax their hand and go one, two, three, four, five. Everybody can feel that the second one is significantly easier. So then we're trying to motivate them not to have fingers sticking out, okay? But that the unused fingers are loose. Again, that's a, I liken it to whittling wood. It's not something that's going to happen like that. It's something that you shave off layers of tension over time. But it's a great time to start working on it. The exercise is simple. As they are working on this, we want to start to use this key song. So they, they're playing legato, they've got a good sound. Now we want to say, okay, what about doing some dynamics with this? And can they do the soft? And then so on, can they do the medium soft? And so on. Okay, I'm working at medium loud and loud. Uh, they learn that they have to use their muscles in a different way to play at different dynamics. Uh, they also gain listening skills. Am I making the sound that I want? Uh, and they can play a game with either you or with their parent. The game is they play the key song. Can you guess what dynamic they were trying to play? Now, if you guess wrong, they're not allowed to tell you. They have to play it again until you guess the right one. They need to make a change so that you are guessing the right one. It's great training for building different sounds. Also want to start to work in a crescendo. When I teach a crescendo, I'll just take a piece of paper and I'll draw little balloons, okay, that are getting bigger and then getting smaller so that they can see a visual representation of the crescendo and the decrescendo. Kids are more visual than they used to be and I find this just makes teaching the crescendo very simple. So that each finger gets louder than the last one and then vice versa when you go down. I also do a decrescendo and a crescendo, not just one way, but flip it the other way. These steps that I'm talking about can take weeks or even months, depending on your student and how old they are. But when they've done them, they've learned to play legato, they've learned to play with different dynamics, they've learned to play with arm weight, good hand position, and good tone. Well, those are all very, very, very important things. Now, we do not always play the piano legato. Sometimes we play staccato. Now, there's different kinds of staccato. The one that I like to teach uh, young children is actually forearm staccato. There's finger staccato, and there's also hand or wrist staccato, but we're going to do the forearm staccato. The forearm, a lot of kids don't know what the forearm is, so you want to first explain what the forearm is, that it's going from their elbow to here. This is great for small children and because it's easier to learn large motions first. Now, what you do is I pull this down and we start on the fall board and they're actually gonna swing and bounce like a ball, okay? You have to have very firm fingers to do this. If your fingers, if their fingers collapse, it doesn't work. The wrist is actually straight. It doesn't bend, it's straight, but it's not tight. And they just bounce like a ball on here. Watch with little children that they're only swinging from their elbow. A lot of kids will do this. And you notice it very easily with me, but if you're dealing with a small child, their arms are so little, you might not notice, but it's really just from the elbow. Then they're gonna play random notes. Any fingers, any notes, doesn't matter. When that's comfortable, then you just take it into the key song. C, D, e, F, G. When that's comfortable, then you're going to do that with different dynamics. So this is a small ball. And then you can have a big ball. Okay. Other things to keep an eye on. 
uh, or ways to help students. Some students have a hard time feeling this. I'll get them just to sit their arm on top of mine while I bounce so they have the feeling of it. A very common problem is they, they go down and then they, they bounce up faster than they go down. And I'll ask them, does that what a ball does? And they think about it and they're like, no, the ball comes up the same speed you bounce down. And I say, well, that's what Jordan needs to do. And I will often also play beside them, right? They, and they're like, notice how I'm timing it. And then they can time with me. The idea is that the motion really never stops. Okay, I'm never stopping how I'm moving. To do this, they need to have very strong fingers. Uh, mushy balls don't, you know, balls that don't have enough air, they don't bounce. Neither do fingers that don't have enough air. As they have mastered the staccato key songs, and they're still working hand separately, but around this time it's a good idea to start putting it together. So then we just do the two hands together. Legato is easier first. Then we put a chord at the end. When that is, feels comfortable, then try staccato. Sometimes they have a hard time, especially around here, different things come out, whatever it is. And then we just do this. We just play that finger maybe five times and then keep bouncing. This is the other one. So we might bounce on that one five times. Okay. Now everything we've done so far has been in C major. But we did not spend our life in piano playing in C major. We also play in other keys, and we need to get comfortable around the black keys. Our students, I think that's very, very important. So I use the music tree. It has th the three levels, main levels I use, which is yellow, red, and green. In the green book, there actually is a presentation on all the major uh, key songs from C to A and uh, major, and then also C to A minor. So minus the black keys, but using the white keys. So C, D, E, F, G, and A major, and then they're minors. And I will use those. So around, I said, oh, yeah, let's move that into your key song practice. We're going to put that in your technique practice. So if they're starting to do them around different ones, as soon as a black key comes in here, this happens a lot. Even with kids who've like, they've really got this transfer, all of a sudden they'll do that. So watch and get, go back to the down up, down up, down up, down up, down up, and go back to guiding their wrist if they need it. Staccato is particularly uh, problematic. They like to do this. Bounce, bounce, touch the black key before they play. And you can see I have a very different motion when I get to the black key. I want to, they want to touch it before in case they miss. So we just want to kick. If you miss the note, you miss the note. It's not the end of the world. It's just a wrong note. And I, I usually joke with my students, I promise you, you're going to play lots of wrong notes in your life. It's okay. You know, we want the motion is more important. And they'll tidy it up and they'll learn how it goes. But just watch for the motions to be the same. So we want to keep using this key song to keep teaching different sounds. You can also use the key song to teach articulation and to teach balance. So I will start, we'll just stick with D major there. We're going to use the right hand legato, the left hand staccato. I call this the legato staccato combo. And off they go. Now I say off they go. Sometimes this does not go well. And maybe after three or four minutes of working, they can do two notes. That's it. And I said, you did it. You got two notes. And I might come and help the right hand stay down. I'll help the legato hand stay down. And I say, you just make sure the other hand bounces. And between the two of us, we managed to get two notes. I said, just go home and practice the two notes. That's enough. And every time I've done that, every single time, the next week they come back and they proudly show me they can play the whole key song up and the whole key song down. If I pushed it in the lesson, I think there would be a sense of I can't do this. But if I say, you know what, it's great, you got two notes. If you can just do notes, you're going to be able to do the whole thing, which is what actually happens. And depending on the student, you want to do one hand, the right hand legato, left hand staccato one week, and then flip it the next week. Some kids can flip it right away. If they can flip it right away, go for it. Things to watch out for as they're learning it. You want to refine how they're moving. Because as we talked about, when you do the legato 
your wrist is moving. When you do the staccato, the wrist is straight, not tight, but straight. So your wrists are actually doing two different things. So the, I usually say, you concentrate on keeping that wrist straight, and I'll help this wrist remember to bend. Okay, so that they're starting to get the feel of doing two different things with their hands. Well, that's huge in piano. How many times do we have to do two different motions, two different things in our hands? And here we are starting to do this while they're still a beginner. It's just a very simple little five finger pattern. Now, after that one is feeling comfortable, the legato and staccato combo, then we're going to do the forte and piano combo or the F and B combo. Let's switch to E major for a change. So what they're going to do here is they're going to play one hand loudly and they're going to ghost the other. And to show you this, I will switch the camera. So when I ghost, I just play on top of the keys like this. You can see they're going down ever so slightly, but there's no sound. And then I'm going to combine that with my right hand playing. And I'll hopefully the right hand will be as loud as possible. A lot of kids, it comes out something like this. And you get some of the notes sneaking in in the left hand, the right hand too soft, different things happen. You want to do this exercise for a couple of weeks until they can play this hand loud and the left hand is ghosting. Now, if the odd note sneaks in and the left hand is absolutely fine, in fact, it makes the next step easier. Because what you're going to do with the next step is all the notes are going to sneak in a little bit or they're going to be half ghosting. They're going to be like half of a ghost. And they won't always sound. Some of them will still disappear, just like that. And that's okay. It's not going to be perfect. And it's important to emphasize that because sometimes what happens is when it sneaks in, the kids say, oh, or it doesn't sound, they try to play it again, and then it always comes out too loudly. So I said, don't worry about it. It'll, it'll come. And over time, it does. You also want to do the reverse, the left hand loud, the right hand ghosting. If they're having a hard time getting this, you can also play on top of their, their fingers, right, to get the feeling of how it feels. Uh, I've also had a lot of success getting students to do it on their lap, play one hand loud, and then play the other hand barely touching on their lap so they can really feel the difference and then go immediately to playing. That can be a very handy one. So the learning outcomes here, this is fabulous training for pieces. You have trained things, hopefully before they need it in pieces. There's physical motions that have been mastered, doing different motions at the same time between the two hands. You develop listening skills. And this is so much easier when facing challenges in pieces. I've come to pieces and said to my students, and they go, oh. I'm like, no, no, you can do that. You've been doing it in your key song for three months. You, you're, you're fine. You know how to do it. And it's a, they're like, oh, okay. And that's a wonderful thing. Now, as this is all beginner things we've been talking about, now maybe we're slipping into pre-grade one. So they're not ready to do grade one, but they're leaving their beginner books, doing some transition material. And you want to start preparing them with some scales. And I like to start with a thumb under exercise. This is a very important exercise. And I at one time tried skipping it. So I thought, oh, I don't need to do this. I can just do it in scales didn't work. I've gone back to doing the thumb under exercise. This is to teach the proper use of the thumb. A lot of times people fall down when they play their thumb, but the thumb actually has to work independently. You have a knuckle back here that's the same as this one, and you need to play from there as well as using this joint. Okay, there's kind of a, a combination of that motion. And it's important to learn to do this because otherwise the scales sound like this. sound so good because every time the thumb plays there's a dig. So to play on the corner of the thumb, you want the thumb joint to be relatively straight, straightish and I usually get people to tap a little bit first. Now this is an exaggerated motion, you would never play your thumb as big as this, but I just want to get them the feel of using their thumb not like this, not like this, but just their thumb. So the rest of their hand stays pretty still. We're just kind of exploring that feel of that thumb working independently, more like a finger. And it's a strange motion. We don't really do that anywhere else in life. It's, a, it's an odd feeling. And just to show the exercise, this is the way this one goes. 
it, you do it three times. One, two, three, one, three, two, two, three, one. So you can see it's the beginning of the C major scale. Just the first four notes going up and going back. And you do the same thing in the left hand, only starting on middle C, go down to G, and then come back. And you do that three times as well. Now how do you present that to a student? I use the idea of an igloo. So my thumb is Marjorie. Marjorie is going to walk into the igloo. This igloo is so fascinating. I'm going to stand up and look down, around. I don't, I'm, I'm so excited I can't even sit down. And then I'm going to walk back out. And it was great, so I'm going to do it again. And I'll do it a third time. And each time I only stand up. The reason for standing up is it's very common to fall down on that middle one, but we actually want the thumb to move away from the hand. You keep the walls of the igloo round. If the walls collapse, I'm like, oh no, Marjorie's getting crushed. When we come back, and, and we don't always use Marjorie, it could be whoever I'm teaching, we'll use their name or whatever we want, then let them choose a name, but we, we give the thumb a name. And watch that four and five are relaxed. I'll say, oh my goodness, look at that igloo. It's the strangest igloo ever. It's got walls sticking out. And we want to keep it slow. And this is what the other reason I like the igloo one, because this igloo, particular igloo, is built on ice. And if you go too fast, you're going to slip and you're going to fall if you run. So you have to go slowly. And I, I make an arrangement with my students. You only need to practice this once, but you need to do it once well. And I want you to do it once slowly. So they've learned to go under three, but they also have to know how to go under four. So for four, it would be easier to show the left hand. You start on the C below middle C, and you go up. This one's a bit trickier. It's a bit harder to go under four. Often you see that fifth finger. Right hand starts on the C above middle C. You go down, you go back up. And it's important that the thumb, you don't want the thumb to hang around outside and then suddenly scooch in. Okay? You walk into this igloo gradually, just behind the finger that's playing. Once they've learned to do the thumb under exercise well, it transfers very easily to a scale. Uh, it's a scale is just the two thumb under exercises put together. They already know how to use their thumb because we've done the thumb under exercise. They know how to stay up on five because we've been working at that in the key song forever and also in the chord. Uh, they know, hopefully know how to use their fingers efficiently. Um, they've got their unused fingers mostly relaxed if not completely relaxed from both the pentachord and the thumb under exercise. So now, we're just gonna walk. Now one of my students said to me, oh, this is like, the igloos are joined together with tunnels and I'm going to my friend's igloo. So this is great, and I use that still to this day. Okay, and we go to Johnny's house or whoever's house, we, we have a lot of fun with it. And the, a lot of the best analogies or metaphors come from your students. So that leads to a scale. A scale is actually can be quite effortless to teach with all this preparation beforehand. Uh, I, sometimes scales, I used to find them, technically a lot of things would happen, but by doing all this preparatory work, the scale itself is actually pretty easy. I haven't spoken today about how to present a scale like in terms of do you read them? Do you teach it with theory? That's a whole other thing. I'm just talking today about the technical aspects. We also want to start to prepare students for triads. So I'm going to talk today about a triad exercise. The thumb under exercise, the triad exercise, and the trill exercise, these all come from uh, the Victoria Conservatory of Music. When I was younger, they had a, an examination system and they had their own technique syllabus and there were some wonderful exercises for uh, preparing things and so these exercises come from there. The syllabus is no longer published but these are the exercises and they're not hard uh, to, to understand. So triad exercises you're going to teach the concept of wrist circles. Now the, any, any motion you do on the piano the idea is you're shifting your arm weight behind the finger that is playing. 
Now we're going to circle that. Okay, we're going to use a circle to do that. Before we've just been going like this, just from one note to another. Now we're shifting that weight in a circular motion. So that's a little bit different. And the left hand, the motion goes clockwise. And in the right hand, the motion goes counterclockwise. Not everybody gets that, so you could also use the idea that when the fifth finger starts, the wrist goes up. When the thumb, or when the fifth finger plays, it doesn't even have to start. When the fifth finger plays, the wrist begins to go up. Third finger, it's at its highest. When the thumb plays, the wrist starts to go down. Three, it's at its lowest point, and it's a shift. And it doesn't matter if you're playing the right hand or left hand. So sometimes I find that's easier for students to understand. Now, why do the triad exercise rather than broken triads? Broken triads are a spiral. You don't actually do a complete circle. You do this and then you do a little mini circle. You use the bottom part of the circle, a mini top circle. This is harder, okay? It's like a spiral like this. The triad exercise is an actual, more like an oval really, but we'll call it a circle. And you can go around the whole thing. Now, just to show the exercise, so you understand what it is, you start in root position and you circle around. That would be root position twice. Then you play the chord. When they play the chord, wrist has some bend to it. Make sure they're lined up with five. They're not pulled in like this, helping the thumb. If the finger's weaker, we put our arm over here. These two notes stay the same. The E and the G stay the same. The C moves up top. They do the same thing, and they circle around, and then play the chord. Okay, making sure they're right up on this finger, very common to see something like this. Also watch for this knuckle. Some kids have a weakness in this thumb knuckle. I can't really do it, but it kind of collapses in. Mine just won't collapse in. But it is common to see this knuckle collapse in. Keep an eye on it. You can just tuck your thumb on here and help it come out. These two notes stay the same. The E moves up top. Same thing. And then there's a chord. And then we get to the top. And then we play. And then you actually replay this top one starting with five. And you can see my wrist goes up. You can see how I'm lining things up. I also take this opportunity to use this to develop a little bit. This side of the hand is definitely weaker than the thumb side. So I'm going to use this as the weeks go on and they're comfortable with it. I'm going to use it as a bit of an exercise. I'm going to ask them to play five too loud, kind of almost ugly loud, and then to play their thumb very soft. Okay, so it's a little bit of dynamics over the course here. The flip side is I'm going to make this side of the hand, it's going to start to get stronger. Also going to get things lined up with here better. Okay. And if you're lucky, every once in a while they even actually voice a chord. It's kind of interesting. It's not my main goal, but it's kind of a nice side, side benefit. Still keeping this loud. And we play this for a long, 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 long time before we move to solid treads. Left hand's just the opposite. We won't run through the whole exercise, but you just do it twice. This is really the essence of connection. Your wrist is moving, it's flexible, and the fingers are firm. Watch the third finger. When they're circling, sometimes you see this and it, it collapses, but it needs to stay round, especially here. Once it collapses, the whole arch under here, it collapses. And you can get kids to feel it. I'll just do it on my hand. I'll go like this and then I'll collapse it and they can feel it flatten. You can just try it yourself where you are. Have your third finger with your arch up, then collapse this knuckle. And you can feel this just completely flatten. It goes from this to that. And we, of course, don't want that. That's the whole thing that we're trying not to have. Okay, that we're trying to develop that round arch. And then the other exercise that I like to teach is a trill exercise. A trill exercise basically is teaching rotary. So it's another. Now we're taking that motion and we're working it over two notes. And I like to play them maybe a Mozart trill, just so they have an idea of what it sounds like. Oh, this is what a trill is. Uh, and they're going to, and sometimes I'll get them to put their hand on my wrist so they can feel that I'm rotating. They can feel, see how I'm moving. Or 
generally children really love ornaments if they're not terrified of them. So the idea of this is to prepare the ornaments that they're going to play later on. We're going to actually start this motion now so that by the time it pops up in a piece, no problem. They're going to, oh, I get to finally use it. Um, so I have them feel my wrist. They're going to rotate back and forth. We want to keep their fingers close to the keys. Now, the first week they may do something like this. That's okay. Just as long as they're rotating. Watch the elbow though. You actually have two bones in your wrist. When you rotate, those bones roll over top of each other. You can feel it if you just put, keep your elbow steady, put your hand on top of your arm, go like this. You can feel the bones rolling on top of each other. If you do this, you can also feel the bones don't move. So a lot of kids will rotate like this. And it can be tough to spot because again, their arms are little. So keep your eye on it. I get them sometimes to put their hand under their elbow going to rock back and forth. Keeping any rocking motion to start is fine and then we want to work on getting that elbow steady. Work on getting the unused fingers loose. That's a big one. Uh, and again I'm going to show you how the exercise goes. So we start with one and two and we just rotate from side to side. Unused fingers loose. Watch the thumb too. Sometimes the thumb goes like this. And again, we want that to be loose. I once had a student whose legs moved like crazy, and I was like, Do you need the bathroom? And she said, No, when I relax, my fingers, my legs feel funny. So when you get to four or five, you really see all kinds of crazy stuff. But you want them to be able to roll back and forth with four and five, like so. And then we come down five, four and so on. We work your way all the way back to the beginning. It's not a fast exercise. It's about getting the rotation and getting things slow. You can't have a great trill with your fingers super high. Okay? If you have super high fingers and, and everything's tight, it's a terrible sounding fill, it, trill. It's inefficient. It doesn't sound great. Same with a wavy elbow. It doesn't work. And I'll demo those as well. Uh, I demo a lot what happens if you don't do something and so that kids feel more motivated to do it. So the kids have learned an awful lot of stuff here. So before they have even hit grade one, they understand basic motions of piano playing. Now there's still some more motions to teach, but these are the, you know, these are basic ones. They've got legato touch, forearm staccato touch, wrist circles, and rotary motion. So there's an awful lot that they've gained in there that they're already doing. Now a big part of teaching is, you know how did the kids, what your students need to do. A bit like being a parent, you know what your, stu your kids need to do, but that doesn't mean they always do it. So how do we do it? So I talked a little bit about it already about having a priority in lessons. I start this process right in the second lesson, as, we, as I talked about before. Really good to start when students are at a young age. They're really eager to learn and they're very keen to please. Okay, little, little ones just, they're so enthusiastic and they have a lot, of, a lot of excitement. You want to do a small amount at each lesson. It's more effective than doing a longer time once a month. That's the revisiting at it each week that makes, time, makes it work. You want to get your student on side. Um, they, they need to believe it's important. Most students, most kids are not going to practice something they don't feel is important. Uh, so as I was just showing you, demonstrate what happens if you don't do it. Emphasize how much difference it will make as they move along. Uh, they'll appreciate that vote of confidence. You're saying to them, hey, I think you're good enough that you're going to keep going. You're, you're going you're gonna to need this in five years, six years. Because honestly, some of these habits are things they're going to need five, six, seven, eight years after you've started. Um... Make it relevant. Point out to them that when you do that, we do these exercises, it's a great time to concentrate on how you're playing. And I'll ask it, so why is this a good time? And they'll look at me and they're like, uh, because it's important. I'm like, yes, that's true. But that's not why this is a good time to do it. I'm like, how about because the notes are easy? You, you know the notes. You don't have to worry about what the rhythm is. You don't have to read the notes. You don't have to look at the finger numbers. You can just look at your hand and look at what it's doing. 
You can wash your hands. Relate to pieces at every opportunity. Does this remind you of anything? Did we do this today? Yesterday I was working on arpeggios with a grade three student. We went to his pieces. The two pieces we worked on both had arpeggios in them. I'm like, oh my gosh. And he's like, oh yeah, and that's like this. And we were making relations all over the place. Ask questions. It's really very powerful to guide students so they discover things for themselves. It's really easy to say, do this because. But if you can ask them a question that helps them make that discovery, this is incredibly powerful, much more powerful than you saying, do it because I said so. I also try to make sure my students realize they're developing their technique for them. You know, they're not doing it for me. They're not doing it for a parent. You know, I can, I, I can already play the piano. I can already do this. This is for you. You know, you want to play to the best of your ability and have them take ownership of that. Use lots of imagination and humor. You need that even sometimes just for yourself and your students will love it. Uh, you want to put the, the technique into the student's world to capture their imagination. Uh, analogy and metaphors, they are your best friend. I've included a lot today. Uh, the igloo example, uh, it went farther. My, I actually got the igloo example from one of my students. Uh, I was teaching him the thumb under exercises probably 20 plus years ago. And he just wasn't getting it. And in his defense, I have to admit, I was teaching it in a rather boring fashion. And I finally, out of desperation, came up with the igloo. And, and he was fascinated with his idea. It was his idea that the, the scale was the tunnels. And then he really got into this. The triad exercise was the igloo on a tilt to whirl the trill exercise was the igloo on a teeter-totter or a seesaw and he loved that and I have I still use it I, I use it to this day so the use of imagination and the thing that he taught me there was that imagination makes things so much less tedious for a child he just lit up when we pulled in that imagination and I'd worked on it for three weeks before this imagination he did it like that Young students, they don't absorb abstract concepts. There's, they're just not going to get them. They just glaze over. They tune out. You need to make it real for them. Something that involves things that they care about, not little fingers where millimeters make such a big difference. Uh, involve your students. A lot of the best ideas will come from them. And then humor. The, the power of a laugh to reset the brain is enormous. Students stay more focused when there is enjoyment, when they're having fun. Now, motivation. The motivation involves repeating and reminding, reminding and repeating and repeating and reminding as many times until you're going to go insane. Uh, it, it's never going to happen without that. However, to keep your sanity and your students' sanity, be creative with that. You can use a lot of nonverbal ways. This is often best. There's no disruption to the piece or the exercise, and you can change the way they're playing without stopping them. So, I will do this a lot. You know, if their fingers are like this, I'll do this. My students all know, oh, got to get my fingers up. Uh, if something's happening on the left hand, sometimes the right hand's better because a lot of us sit on the right side. I start to stand up to walk around to the left side. Often by the time I get there, whatever was wrong has fixed itself. Um, and I move my wrist in the air. So if they're doing the triad exercise, even without playing, I'll just, just do this. And they're like, oh, right, I got to remember to do that. Uh, if they're not using their thumb properly, I bend over like this. Again, by the time I've bent my head down, usually it's fixed itself. I play with my students a lot. Students pick up a lot from watching what you do. I'll play on top of their fingers. I'll play on their arm. Sometimes if I'm going to check what they're doing, I'll have them play on my arm and I'll say, well, yours feels like this. This is the feel we want. That can save you buckets of time, buckets and buckets of teaching time. There's also verbal ways. Uh, round your fingers, igloo, bunny paw, no wobbles, corner of your thumb. I write giant reminders with highlighters across uh, their, their practice book with their lesson practice notes. Uh, I'll draw a picture. I make sticky notes for them to put on their piano. Uh, and I draw a little face of me and whatever the reminder is, and they're supposed to put it here or here. This is a great spot. And uh, interestingly enough, when the pandemic started, I had a senior student and an upright piano, and this end of the piano was entirely covered with sticky notes. There was probably 15 to 20 of them there. I think she'd saved every sticky note I'd ever given her. And they were all on the piano for reminders. 
And I, I said to one of my students, now you, you've got to remember to do something this week. And he said, don't worry, Marjorie, there's a sticky note on my piano. I was like, okay. So you can use that very creatively. Uh, another thing that is so important is just teacher perseverance. The, everything I've just said may or may not work. And sometimes it'll work for some things and not for others. And then you have to persevere. Students really have to believe on some level that you will insist that they do it. And you're not going to give up until they get it, and then don't. Uh, your belief uh, that they will do it is very powerful. It doesn't have to be spoken, and usually it's better if it's not. Um, they know intuitively. Kids are amazing. They know intuitively when you're going to bend, and if they sense you'll bend, some of them, they just, they'll go, okay. And other kids, they have to know that that boundary's there. It's like, mm, yeah, no, I'm not going to bend. You're going to, you're going to get it. And I remember one of my senior students, I said, okay, we're going to do this. And she I said, what's the matter? And she said, well, I don't think I can do it, but you're telling me I could do it. So, I mean, I know that means I can, and I'm going to have to. And she put her hands up and off she went. And that, that's the kind of relationship you want to build over time, that your students have that trust in you, that you can help them get it. Uh, keep it positive. Don't turn it into a battle. Keep nagging pleasantly, creatively, and eventually they'll get it. It can take a long time. You have to realize your power as a teacher. Most children will rise to meet your expectations. There's a school study where they sent students into a new year with a new teacher. They told the new teacher that the children that were underperformers were overperformers. And the, the students the previous year that were overperformers, they told the new teacher they were underperformers. When the new teacher taught them, they flipped. The underperformers did become overperformers, and the overperformers became underperformers. Now I'm simplifying, but I think this is really important to remember as a teacher. The, the power of the influence you have when you have that belief, it, it's so profound, and it is a responsibility. If all else fails, there's always hope. You need a good dose of hope when you teach for a long time. Uh, you can hope that somebody else tells them. I've had that happen. My students go play in the festival and they've come back and said to me, the adjudicator said this and you always say that. And I do keep a straight face when they do that. Inside I'm laughing, but I, I really, and I just keep a straight face. Um, sometimes they think, think they're hearing it for the first time and, and that's okay. You've planted the seeds so that when they went to the festival or wherever they went, an exam, um, anything that where they go, okay, that where they're getting feedback, they go, oh, they'll have the understanding because you've planted the seeds. You can reinforce it gently at the next lesson, it, uh, graciously though, uh, it's more powerful that way. If you get into the I told you so, you're creating an adversarial relationship and that's not going to be good. So I like to sum up with just talking a little bit or end with talking about effective teaching traits. These are things that I've observed over the years and the teachers that I really admire, uh, the ones that I see teaching week after week, year after year, uh, all types of students well. Uh, persistence. You have to keep trying. You have to believe that somehow, someday, it's going to sink in. If you stop trying, you've made the decision for the child. They're not going to get it you've made that decision. And as an adult and as a teacher, you have that responsibility to keep the option open for the child. You keep that door open for the day they're gonna walk through. Ingenuity. You have to have a lot of ingenuity to be an effective teacher. Be a magician with a huge bag of tricks. And you pull out different tricks for different children, different weeks. Sometimes the one that worked the previous week doesn't work the next week. Always be ready to change it. You can have your tried and true but you have to be willing to take different twists and turns and be willing to invent things. My igloo example came out of desperation. Some of my very best teaching tricks have come from desperation. Uh, energy. Knowing what students need to do is the easy part. It's getting them to do it. That's what takes all the energy and all the enthusiasm and, and sometimes you feel like a cheerleader. Uh, and then I think the other thing that's very important is kindness. A really big dose of kindness helps and it develops a positive relationship with your student. Sometimes I tell stories about my journey like when kids are like oh, my fingers are never going to be round. I tell them the story when I was around their age and I was maybe seven or eight or nine and I went up the street to Mrs. Tweedale who was a 
I mostly study piano with my mom, but my mom would send me to Mrs. Tweedell occasionally. And I went up and she said, Marjorie, dear, you need to play with round fingers. And I looked at her hand and I thought, oh, Mrs. Tweedell, my fingers are never going to do that. And I really genuinely thought my fingers are never going to stay round like hers did. And my students absolutely adore that story. It gives them hope. I think also you have to realize the reward of what you're doing. And this helps you to stay motivated. The better the student's connection or technique is from the beginning, the easier your teaching and their learning will be as they advance. And as I alluded to earlier, you are earning their trust. You are creating a relationship that allows that student to develop musically and personally. And that's a very precious thing. What I'd like people to take as a takeaway today is to realize the enormous amount of teaching and learning that happens before grade one, when students are beginners. I heard, not teachers per se, but I've heard people say, oh, it doesn't matter what teacher they have when they start. It, it, it boggles my mind because you, this, you have an immense responsibility. You are setting up their attitude towards learning, you're setting their hands on the keys, you're developing habits, practice habits, and a connection to the keyboard and an attitude toward learning that will set habits for a lifetime. And that's what I have to say today and thank you all for listening and I don't see any questions in the question box but if anybody wants to add anything in there, if I need to clarify anything, please feel free and I happily answer. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Marjorie. Wonderful ideas here. So many great, great things for us to take away. Yeah, anyone, any questions, throw them in the chat box, the Q&A. We have one here right now. LaDonna is asking, are there any suggestions for double jointed fingers in young students? Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that's where those joints break so easily because uh, they, they're so yeah. flexible. I, I'm not a good one for that because my, actually my fifth finger is double jointed here. Uh, the, really, the only one you can do is try to keep it up. I, and the circles is the best one for, for developing that. If I really think about it, I can keep... Uh, my left one, it really is badly double-jointed. I can keep it up, but if I play chords, it does straighten. There's nothing I can do about it. I do try to help kids... I've managed with my right one to get this one up. It's really the circles is the best one that I have run into. And then just asking kids to keep it as round as they can. I have found that if I start with students when they're young enough, the double joints seem to work themselves out over time. I, I've not had as much success when they're transfer students when they come and the habit is deeply ingrained. Mm -hmm. It's the testament to getting all these things right from the start as quick as we can. As best as you can, at least mm -hmm. planting seeds. So sometimes these seeds don't sprout until later, but if yeah. you've planted them, there's a chance. If they're not planted, they'll never sprout. Yeah. And then how to plant them. You've, got, you've given us so many neat, humorous things, images to use with our students. And of course, we all have our own. But I think that's just uh -huh. a wonderful way to approach kids. You have to approach them on their level in a way yeah. that gets inside that childlike mind and, and, and it piques their curiosity. Uh -huh. And something else you said, too, about using as few words as possible. I often talk to teachers about that as well. I think that's really key to the more musicians don't like to be spoken to necessarily. They, they actually like to practice things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we get talking a little bit too much with them. Well, and I think often if you tell a child everything you're going to do before you start, there's a large segment of children that freeze. Um, they, 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 after the first piece of information, they're like, because they, they can't remember all those things and mm -hmm. they're so stiff before you even start because they're terrified because they can't remember those 10 things you told them whereas if we just start and then I gradually add one thing at a time they're some of them are still nervous but it's more it's a more manageable amount um, mm -hmm. I found the pandemic hard actually because so much of my teaching with young children was nonverbal, and then the pandemic hit and that nonverbal did not work very well it was very, very hard. I, I settled with having an iPad up here and then a computer over here. And on the iPad was my face. So I could at least do my nonverbals and they could see them in front of them. You know, I'd do things like this and this while they were playing and, and I could get in 
a small amount of nonverbals, but it, it was very tough. It, it probably turned me into a better teacher. I had to use more verbals and get my descriptions more succinct so that they could understand them, but it was tough. Yeah, I can relate to that too, not having started a beginner for at least five years until this year, suddenly I have four of them. And I'm trying to get back to that nonverbal approach, trying to shake off what happened during the pandemic when we had to you know, dictate so much. Mm -hmm. um, and I find students, maybe they're just not quite as receptive as they used to be to the nonverbal cues. Maybe it's just going to take time. I'm not sure. Or my, my own comfort level with it. I'm, I'm not sure yet. Yeah, I'm not sure I've run into that. I, I find, though, that the... I'm almost teaching without teaching. They don't realize I'm teaching. It, that's what I think it is. You're teaching and you're molding without them realizing you're doing it. Yeah. Uh, and I remember watching both my mom and Mrs. Wood teach, which were two of the just such pivotal people in, in my teaching journey. And they both had that ability. I, I can remember we used to have to teach in pedagogy and we'd spend 15 minutes teaching something. And then Mrs. Wood would get up and in three minutes, she had done what, and way better than what we'd tried to do for 15. It was just, she was so efficient in how she knew how to do things. And that's also time. I, I know that I supervise and mentor a number of junior teachers and they, they're they always joking. Their students come to have master classes with me and they're always joking, oh no, it's my humble pie day. Because they, they come in and then I will reteach something or or teach something. And they're like, how do you do that so fast? And, and it always makes me laugh because I think, how on earth did I end up being able to do that? Because I remember being in their shoes. But it, that's experience and time. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it does. Sometimes I don't know how I teach things. I know I need less words than I used to 15 to 20 years ago. Many less words. Yeah. And I think sometimes you just, I guess, also, I should mention this. If you have not done any of these things and you might feel a little intimidated by starting, and I do remember feeling that way. I remember seeing Mrs. Wood teach and just being on an overload with information on, on everything she was doing. And I was teaching at the time. And so I just set myself a goal as a teacher. I was going to teach one thing that I learned to a student. And I, I taught it to all my students. They were all beginners at the time. And I taught it to every student that I had on, I just taught on Saturday mornings when I was at UVic. And I would teach it to all those students on Saturday morning. And that allowed me to absorb it, but I just picked one. Because if I thought about everything, I almost didn't want to start. I didn't know where to start. So I just picked one. And I started there. And then the next week I'd refine that one and then maybe add something else. And each week I just challenged myself to try one thing. Not always effectively, but I learned. And you, you learn from your students as much as they learn from you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a lot of, there are some experienced teachers on the call here. If you want to raise your hand and come on and get on the discussion, here's sort of a, a last call for that as our time's getting a little thin here now towards an hour and 20 minutes. Um, the joy of learning and practicing, how to instill it and have it be joyful. This struck me today too, is, is something really important that's, yeah. You know, sometimes missing and you can sense it in the lessons when we're being so detailed and getting them to do so much and use so much of their brain it's easy to forget that right mm -hmm. yeah I think so and I I'm definitely better than I used to be at finding mm -hmm. moments to smile laugh stretch um figure out what's important where we really need to focus and where we can bend a little you know yeah. where we can, we can be a little bit more relaxed where, okay, now this is where I need to take advantage. This is where, I, this is the crux of what we need to do. And, and the other times, you know, I recently, I have two students, honestly, they need to stand during their lesson. Um, yeah. and that's new for me. I've, I've never done that before. Uh, I created a rule, both feet have to be on the floor. That's my rule. <laughs> And uh, they both tested it this week. I said, no, no, no. If you don't keep both feet on the floor, you have to sit. So they were planting both of them. But they both said to me they found it easier to focus and easier to see the music, actually. It was mm -hmm. really interesting. Um, we didn't do that during technique. During technique, we sat. But when it was time to read new pieces, and they actually sat the way I'd like them to while they were playing their prepared work that they practiced. 
But when we got to new things, they really felt they needed to stand. And there was just a small shift. And I was like, okay, well, we've done our technical stuff. And sure, why not? Let's try it. And, you know, I don't want them dancing all over the room. But with the two feet on the floor rule, they felt like they were getting a little bit of bending that they needed. But I still had parameters around it, mm -hmm. which kept it from getting out of control, which is important. So it's, I think it's that. I think it's figuring out how to bend but still keep parameters around it where the children can learn. In fact, standing helped them learn more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're pretty much at our time. I'm not seeing any other questions here. If anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to email us and let us know. Otherwise, you know, Marjorie, thanks so much for, for putting so much time and energy into the presentations that you were just a wonderful mentor. And I've always enjoyed talking about these sort of things and geeking out on piano teaching with you. And the fact that we could share this with a larger, larger audience now is really wonderful. And I'm sure we'll have you back to talk more about these things. So thanks so much. Um, thanks for your comments in the chat box there. And uh, have a wonderful couple of weeks, everyone. We'll, we'll rejoin you again on Friday, March 10th when Eleanor and Cecil will rejoin us. Hope you all have a great weekend and bye for now.